Welcome to this unit. Why is it that some people suffer from the metabolic syndrome, while others do not show any signs of it, even though they haven't got the best lifestyle? You heard in the introduction that metabolic syndrome is a very complex disease. Both our environment, but also our genes have a big influence on the development of the metabolic syndrome. Therefore, in this unit, we will discuss those two aspects in order to understand the onset of the disease. Before we dive into the role of our genes in the development of the metabolic syndrome, let's have a closer look into the environment that favors the development of the disease. Many of the symptoms like overweight and obesity or type 2 diabetes have their origin in our lifestyle and more so in the environment that we live in. Because our evolutionary path where we had to survive over stretches of low food availability, we are designed to live as energy efficient as possible in order to conserve energy for times when food is not available. This increased the chances of survival for our ancestors. Nowadays, however, we live in times where accessibility to food is mostly no issue at all. Even more so, the opposite is true. We are surrounded by energy-dense nutrition and at the same time physical activity is reduced in the most people compared to our ancestors. So it is no surprise that our bodies react to these ra rapid changes by storing all the excess energy that they get. In this context, we need to define some terms connected to energy expenditure. Basal metabolic rate refers to the amount of energy an individual uses to maintain essential body functions, such as respiration, circulation, and digestion. Total energy expenditure also include food-induced thermogenesis and energy that we use as a result of physical activity. Based on that, our daily calorie intake should be calculated. But this is also dependent on our age, sex, size, and of course on how much we move. Do you know how many calories an adult woman is suggested to eat every day? How about men? And why can men eat more? And why do some people gain weight easily and some not? That's an easy calculation. When you eat more than you burn, the excess energy is stored in the body. On the other hand, if our energy expenditure is higher than what we eat, we lose weight. Yes, Ali, that would be a very simple scheme. However, reality is much more complex than that. Have you ever asked yourself why some people that eat the same and also have comparable movement are different from each other? While one person gains weight easily, the other one does not. Metabolic syndrome prevalence varies among ethnic groups, between the sexes, and that indicates that there are associated genetic factors underlying disease development. When we talk about genes and nutrients, nowadays it is very common to hear two terms associated with it, nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics. As they are very commonly confused, we would like to clarify what each of them refer to. Nutritional genomics or nutrigenomics is the field of study that looks into the relationships between the genes and nutrition. It means that certain food can affect how genes are expressed. If we have a greater understanding of potential nutrient gene interactions, then it might be possible to manipulate diet in a way to minimize the metabolic risk of obesity, to attenuate insulin resistance, and the development of the metabolic syndrome. An example for nutrigenomics is the link between dietary fat and the development of the metabolic syndrome. On the one hand, high fat diets, in particular high saturated fatty acid diets, have been shown to have detrimental effects on adiposity, inflammation, and insulin sensitivity. Promoting the development of insulin resistance, the metabolic syndrome, and type 2 diabetes. On the other hand, fatty acids, in particular mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids, have been shown to directly change gene expression and have protective functions to its inflammation and heart disease. And they are also beneficial on insulin and glucose concentrations. There is a big market behind healthy diets. 
but finding scientific basis for those diets is very difficult. There are many reasons. First of all, researchers have to recruit big cohorts of people and they have to consider many confounding factors such as gender, ethnicity, and age. In general, up to 30% of searches are not responsive to dietary interventions. Moreover, it seems that pre-intervention dietary intake might also affect the outcome. Therefore, very, very few diets have scientific basis. Keep that in mind. Let's get to nutrigenetics now. Nutrigenetics study how our genes affect our response to nutrients. This means that our genetics will influence our absorption, use, tolerance and requirements for the different foods and nutrients according to our individual genetic variation. An example of nutrigenetics is lactose intolerance, in which a person cannot digest lactose, which is the natural sugar in milk. Asu, you are our sugar expert. Do you want to explain that? Sure, people with lactose intolerance lack the gene that makes the enzyme lactase, located in the small intestine that breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose. Because there is a buildup of lactose in the small intestine, these people may suffer the symptoms of bloating, gas and diarrhea within 30 minutes to 2 hours after drinking milk or eating dairy products. So these people lack the gene to create the enzyme lactase and thus are lactose intolerant. Gene expression of the lactase gene can also depend on where we come from and can also change with age. Exactly. While this is not an association that has major consequences for the metabolic syndrome, other nutrigenetic causes might have. Nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics require an understanding of nutrition, genetics, biochemistry, and a range of omit technologies to understand the complex interaction between genetic and environmental factors which are relevant to metabolic disease and health. Most of you have heard the saying, we are what we eat. And of course there's truth to it. But you could also say you are what your parents or your grandparents ate. How is that? We all have our personal mix of risk and of course also protective genes. We inherit the genes from our ancestors and in some cases a mutation in one gene leads to the development of a phenotype. We call it a monogenic cause. In the context of the metabolic syndrome, this could for example be the disruption of the leptin gene, a hormone that is produced by the adipose tissue that controls appetite. When leptin is not produced, affected persons always feel hungry and become severely obese because they simply do not know what satiety is and cannot stop eating. However, genetic disruptions of single genes are quite rare. The metabolic syndrome is more a polygenic disease. This means that many subtle genetic variants, which each in itself have minimal effect, together have a cumulative outcome and increase a person's risks to get metabolic syndrome. The problem with these subtle changes is that they are difficult to track down. Therefore, in the following videos, we will discuss those polygenic causes, how the environment can influence our genes, and how scientists measure those changes. Let's summarize what we talked about in this video. We explained the term energy expenditure and gave you an introduction to nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics. Let's now give you a bit deeper understanding of the genetic basis of the metabolic syndrome.